let it go. It's just stuff. Number two. You can't change the people around you, but you can change the people around you. And number three, love people and use things because the opposite never works. Mm. What is minimalism? So, so the way I think about minimalism is it's the thing that gets us past the things so we can make room for life's most important things, which actually aren't things at all. Mm. The average American household has more than 300,000 items in it. And that's not me going around counting other people's stuff. That's <laughs> LA Times reported that a mm -hmm. few years ago. And it's not that things are inherently bad or evil, just like you talked about marketing. When marketing's done really well, you're being polite and saying, hey, I might have a solution to a problem that you already have. We, we do kind of have a problem. When we moved when I was a kid, one of the boxes, you know, you label the boxes you pack stuff in, yes. was labeled seldom used kitchen items. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that is the world we live in. Isn't it? It's yeah. rather specific. Um, <laughs> and and I, I think the thing is, with all those items, they actually get in the way of what a more meaningful life can be. We tend to, we make these aspirational purchases, like, oh, that looked really great on that mannequin, or that car looked really great in that ad. I think it's going to add value to my life, but is it really going to add value? So for me, minimalism was a way for me to figure out what are the things that are truly going to add value to my life, that amplify, that augment it, those three words that Ryan mentioned, just in case, right? Like, we go to get rid of something, you're like, ah, you know what, I should hold on to this just in case I need it someday in some non-existent hypothetical future, right? And, and so we amass these sort of hordes, and when the first junk drawer fills up, we just we allocate a, a second junk drawer, and when that one fills up, we, we find a cabinet or cupboard or something, and we need more and more space. And so it, we, we don't give ourselves permission to let go of these things. And I found that I was holding on to so many things just in case, whether it was a sentimental item. And, and I didn't even have a plan to do anything with it. I, I was sort of a, a well-organized hoarder. Like, I wasn't a candidate for the, the, the TV show hoarders. There were no dead cats in my freezer or anything. <laughs> But, but I, I owned a lot of stuff, right? And so I had an, an ordinal system of bins and boxes in, in my basement. And, and uh, you know, I, so I used to weigh 80 pounds more than I weigh now. And, and so I had a lot of, like, double XL shirts. Like, that was my plan in case I, just in case I gain 80 pounds back, I'll have these out-of-date clothes to wear someday. <laughs> And when you say, start saying things out loud, you realize how ridiculous many of the things that, that we're holding on to are. But I, I, I don't... I just want to be clear, like, don't get me wrong, there, there are some things that add immense value to my life. In fact, it's the weird paradox of minimalism. I get far more value from the, the items that I have now than if they were watered in my experience of life, and then get rid of those things that are just in the way. What is that excess that, I mean, I look at our items as there are three different types of items. There are the essentials. We all have the same basic essentials, right? We, we all need clothing and shelter and food. And then there are non-essentials, the things that truly add value to our lives, things that will make our life better when we have them. And there's the third category, and that is junk. That is the seldom used kitchen items, right? And seldom used actually means just in case. I think those are the three most dangerous words in the English language, right? It means I'm going to hold on to these just in case I might need them someday and some. It's the line. It's a line of somebody that has uh, the psychological disorder of hoarding. Hoarding. Yeah, they yeah. use that same line, and in a sense, we all have a little bit of that disorder in this culture, don't we? Well, yeah. I, I was a just well, in case. I was a well-organized hoarder, so <laughs> it, you, you, you came to my house. I, I wasn't a candidate for the TV show because all of my stuff were, were in all of these bins and boxes and ordinal alphabetized system of stuff that I was never going to use in my yeah. basement, in my second living room, mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. attic. All of these things, I had built this mausoleum of stuff called a suburban house mm -hmm. and, and decided, well, I think these things are going to make me happy. Well, maybe the next thing will make me happy. Maybe the next thing. But, of course, you get that next thing, and the, the ephemeral pleasure, it doesn't last far past the checkout line. Yeah, it turns out the VHS collection probably isn't going to work out. <laughs> yeah. Someday, just in case. Yeah. <laughs> the cassette collection is oh. probably just not going to work out. So for me, uh, you know, it's weird, Dave, if you were to have told my 18-year-old self 
what my 28 year old self was going to have, Mm -hmm. I would have been the most excited 18 year old. Like, wow, I'm going to, I'm going to be buying a new car. Uh, well, you know, borrowing money to buy a new, I'm going to be able to buy a new car every couple of years. I'm going to, I'm going to be able to get a 2000 square foot home with, with two living rooms. I'm going to, I'm going to have a, a, you know, a, a good job at a respectable corporation and I'm going to be so happy. And I, I did have everything that I ever wanted at 28 years old, but I didn't have happiness. I had a lot of discontent. I had a lot of debt. I was, I was miserable and I didn't really know which way was up. And I, re- I remember seeing Josh make these changes in his life over several months to the point where, uh, he, he started making, uh, I remember the, what really, really caught my attention is he started giving our boss rules on when our boss was allowed to contact him. <laughs> hey man, I'm not going to answer my phone after nine o'clock. Uh, if it's Christmas Eve, it's 6 PM and I'm at to dinner, I'm going to ignore your call because it's Christmas Eve and I'm spending time with uh, friends or I'm spending time with family. And th- that type of talk was kind of sacrilegious. <laughs> so I went to Josh and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Like, what is going on with you, man? Why, why are you so happy? And that's when he, he introduced this thing called minimalism to me. And not only that, he showed me a whole community of people who called themselves minimalists. And it was a wide range of people. There was a guy named Colin Wright who was traveling the world, carrying everything he owned on his back. Mm-hmm. Um, I like having a kitchen table, so that wasn't like the most appealing life. Uh, but then there's a guy named Leo Babauta. He had eight, uh, I'm sorry, he had six kids, uh, him and his wife living out in San Francisco. There was a gal named Courtney Carver. She was living in Salt Lake City with her teenage daughter. But what I realized is is that there are these people living meaningful lives and they're using this thing called minimalism to do it. So I got really excited. I looked at Josh. I said, all right, man, I'm in, I'm going to be a minimalist. Now what? I didn't really know where to start. You get rid of your stuff. Right. So we started with, uh, I didn't want to spend several months packing up like Josh had. I mean, that was a great approach for him, but I, you know, I just needed uh, some faster results, typical American mm-hmm. attitude, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, we came up with this crazy idea called a packing party where we decided to pack all my belongings as if I were moving. And then I would unpack only the items I needed over the next three weeks. So Josh came over and he literally helped me box up everything, my clothes and kitchenware, my towels, my TVs, my electronics, my frame photographs and paintings, my toiletries, and even my furniture, everything. We literally pretended like I was moving. So after, uh, you know, three weeks of unpacking, you can imagine those first things I'm unpacking some clothes for work, a toothbrush some toiletries. Well, after those three weeks, I had 80% of my stuff still sitting in those boxes, just sitting there unaccessed. And I had this huge, uh, just light bulb moment about how I have spent this past, you know, decade of my life accumulating tens of thousands of dollars worth of things to make me happy. And they were not doing their job. So I decided to donate and sell all of it. And that's really where the minimalists.com started. It was with that 21 day packing party story. And problematic for many people, including myself. Yeah. I, I've done some pretty interesting experiments over the last uh-huh. six years. What are the experiments you've done? You've gone without a phone for a few months, right? I, I did. I, so, so when I first, uh, I first became a minimalist, I said, okay, I'm going to work hard on paying down my debt. So I moved to this tiny $500 a month apartment in Dayton. Wow. Um, and I just started going crazy on paying off all my debt, right? So right. I said, I don't want to be tied to this lifestyle anymore. In order to be to not be tied to this career, I need to be able to pay off this debt. And so yeah, I went on the the ramen noodle diet, wow. not, not not literally, sure, but, sure. but 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 thousand dollar a month, yeah, lifestyle. Yes, yeah, I, I spent as as little as I could, so so that I could get out of debt and no longer be tied to the same obligations, right? And and so. Uh, when I moved into that apartment, I didn't hook up internet for the first few days because it was like a weekend or whatever. And I'm like, huh, I wonder if I could go 30 days without internet at home. 30 days without internet. So I, I'm going to try it. It'll give me something to write about, right? Sure, sure. Um, that was it was five years ago, and I have not had internet at home since. And, and I run an online business. Holy cow. And, and so so I can tell you the reason I don't have internet what is... What about your phone? You've got internet there. I, sort of. Sort of. But but I, I found a way around that too because I wanted to be I wanted to be able to write about that. Wow. Uh, so, so it was the most productive month of my life. Wow. When, and, and those 30 days. And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to get it back next month. Either. And so it just sort of continued from there. And it's not to say that I won't ever have it again someday. I, I, we have an office in, in Missoula, Montana. So I, I drive to the office and, and it's a place where I can work schedule there. it. Yeah, I can work there. And, and I have an office at home. 
home too, and uh, but there's no internet there. But that, that's a, that's a place for me to create. But you're probably so focused when you're at home writing. It, it's deep work. It, it's it's full concentration. You're so, in the flow. Yeah, you're not distracted by social media likes and yes, who left a comment here and exactly. And so so yes, I do have a phone at home, but I keep it on, as soon as I get home. The first thing I do is put it on this charging stand. And in fact, I I, I do I go out of my way to like keep it away from my person. We, we, you were asking me if I had a picture of something earlier. I had to like go into my bag and dig my phone out because I, I try to be as present as I can mm-hmm. and I, I'm constantly failing at that and that's okay. Like I, I, I'm, I'm not anyone's Yoda. I, sure, I, sure. I, I, I fail at it all the time but I learn so much from it. So when I got rid of uh, internet, it was uh, maybe six months earlier, I'd got rid of TV at home. And that's and right. and realize that you know that wasn't adding as much value as I thought it was. It was disconnecting time. you from your partner or your mm-hmm. children or whatever. Yeah, yeah. and and so I I was so, so I, no TV. I had no TV, and then I did no internet, and then for two months I got rid of my cell phone. And you learn about a special kind of loneliness, like once. Because <laughs> I mean, think about this: you've removed all your pacifiers, right? Because it was my first. You have to be with your thoughts. Yeah, you have to be with your thoughts, but but then, and you have to be with you know people, and you have to make plans in a different way. And also, here was the interesting thing: you learn a lot about your friends too, because because if you're going to meet someone for lunch, and and yeah, I'm running a few minutes behind, yes, you text really quick, yeah, right. I couldn't do it. You anymore. were just there, and you're on time. And you're waiting. Oh, yeah, and you learn how what's happening. There aren't, aren't any. Pay phones anymore i mean there, there was one in dayton Nothing. where i lived i had to you know walk in the rain four or five blocks and to you get don't there. even have quarters anymore so no. you're like how do i play? <laughs> what do i do <laughs> yeah and so you're not remembering the numbers anymore no they're all plugged in our phone i used Absolutely. to remember every number yeah yeah growing up, you know your five friends uh-huh. your home phone you know yeah there's a great john mayer lyric he, he talks about the shape of calling like i no longer remember the shape of calling home and and the shape of calling home huh? yeah because you got you know you remember yeah, used yeah. to remember these numbers like on, on yeah, the yeah, keypad the, there or the the, the little dial ringer you remember those oh yes day? yeah the, the rotary phone yes yes that was me like age six or seven <laughs> yeah we totally i grew up with one of those yep. uh so so yeah I, I realized that that once i removed all these pacifiers that i had to I had to fill the void with something else that was more, maybe more meaningful. And so I'd rediscovered these things called books. <laughs> They're amazing, let me right. tell you. But you're so minimalist, you didn't have books. <laughs> <laughs> so you just rented them from the library. Yeah. No, I wrote them. And you then I read them. And then you read them. <laughs> no, I mean, so I, I rediscovered time to, to create more. I rediscovered time. And then the cool thing is, minimalism isn't about that. If we did that, we wouldn't really be able to help many people, would we? So, you know, for us, it's not, about, um, it's not about having nothing. It's certainly not about deprivation. Uh, like I said earlier, every, we have a lot of important things in our lives. In fact, everything we have is important. It adds value or, you know, brings us joy or it serves a purpose. And the, 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 all the things that you listed, it's not like we started just, you know, oh, we're going to start the minimalist.com and do we got to write three books? We got to start a podcast. We got the documentary that's going to come out in 2016. Oh, by the way, we got to plan these tours and then we got to make sure we're on all these major networks. I mean, all of this has happened very organically. I mean, even with the documentary, I remember our directors up there, Matt, he, he came with us on tour in 2014 and uh, he just filmed a bunch of stuff and we had no idea what was going to become of it. We had, we had very low expectations, but we have very high standards. And what ended up happening was the, the result that you see now the, with minimalism, a documentary about the important things. But it certainly didn't start off with, we're going to have Netflix deals, we're going to be in theaters. It was just, you know, Matt, um, who is a minimalist himself, just wanted to join us to work on something that he was passionate about. And then it turned into something amazing. And that's kind of, you know, a, a short version of what Josh and I have done over the last six or seven years. Um, it's things that, what Josh said earlier, it's things that we're able to put on our plate because we keep our plate so clear of, of distractions that we're able to take on these things. Mm. And yes, over the last six or seven years, like we have had some amazing things happen and we have had a lot of things happen, but it's, you know, I kind of look at it as something we have like layered on top of each other. You know, when I, when we first started, it was the blog and essays. And then I started getting a bunch of emails about, um, hey, can you, you know, 2,000 word emails on a regular basis. Like, hey, can you, you know, help me fix all my life problems? And I'm like, God, I wish I could like somehow, you know, help people to do this. I can't answer every 2,000 word email I get. So I started a a little mentoring, a little coaching business. And uh, Josh was getting a lot of questions on writing. So he started a writing class. And then from there, uh, we, you know, we wrote uh, Minimalism, uh, uh, our, our first book. 
And at the end of the day, it was, again, layered on. We would, we would keep our plates clear, say yes to the things that we had uh, time for, the things that uh, we had space for. And we've continued that approach throughout. And yes, looking back, it sounds like so much, but it's, it's been very intentional. And the reason why we've been able to do so much is because we have, again, been able to say no uh, to a lot of things. So we can say yes to these very big, important things. Yeah. And what's important. Mm, yeah. That's part of it, isn't it? Yeah, Absolutely. It's just, you know, we're redefining what's important. Yeah. yeah. The gathering of stuff is not what's important. Right. right. And it's not, it's not a lack of stuff. No. It doesn't have to be that you... You know, you're not a, a bad minimalist if you have over 104 items. I mean, right, you can't. There's not a mark like that. It's it's mm-hmm. a mindset that says stuff is not where I'm going to draw my happiness. Stuff is not where I'm going to draw my meaning. Is that right? Exactly. I'm so glad you bring that up because the packing party. You're right. Like me packing up my stuff and being confronted with 80 percent of my possessions. It wasn't. You're right. It wasn't the packing up of the stuff. It wasn't getting rid of the 80% of stuff that, that was freeing. What was freeing is reprioritizing what my priorities were. Mm-hmm. Because up until that point, if you would have asked me, hey, Ryan, what are your priorities? I would have said, well, uh, my health, that's a major priority. But I was eating fast food every day. My finances, I want to retire. Uh, but I was spending money on all that stuff. Yeah. And what I realized is my priorities, it's not what I say I do. It's what I actually do. Someone in the comments section, they were like, you know, it sounds like it's, you know, I don't know what the big deal is, guys. It doesn't sound like you gave up anything that was important. And Josh was like, that's exactly it. We didn't give up anything that's important. Everything we have in our lives right now, it is important. And I think that's what minimalism is really about. It's about determining what is important in one's life. And that is different for everyone. Yes. We focus on what I want my priorities to be. And I think like the, the biggest thing that minimalism really helped me do is to get clear on what my priorities were and what I wanted them to be. Because for the longest time, like if you, were to, if you were to ask my you know, 25 or 26-year-old self, like, hey, Ryan, what are your priorities? I would have said, well, my health. If I'm not healthy, well, I'm not happy. Uh, my relationships, you know, my, my, uh, my mom, she lived a half hour away. I might have seen her six or seven times a year. Uh, my health-wise, I was eating out fast food a lot. Or I would say, oh, you know, I'm working on the big passion project that I've been putting off for two years. That's my priority. And what I realized is that I gave my priorities a lot of lip service. And what I was able to do is to actually make my priorities my actual priorities. And that's what our priorities are. It's not what we say they are. It's what we actually do with our time. Yeah. Uh, we have something called uh, the 30-day minimalism game. And, you know, decluttering, it can be boring sometimes. So Josh and I decided to, you know, make it fun uh, by adding a little bit of friendly competition. So you find a friend or a family member or a coworker who wants to get rid of stuff. And you both agree to play this game, and you start on the first day of the month. So, you know, July is just around the corner. Uh, you could start on July 1st. You both agree to get rid of one thing on the first day of the month. And then on the second day of the month, you get rid of two things. And then on the third day of the month, three things. And then on the fourth day, okay, so forth and so on. You probably get how it works. So it starts off really, really easy, right? Up until you get to, like, day 19, you get rid of 19 things. And then, you know, the next day on day 20, you're like, oh, crap, i got to get rid of 20 things today. And uh, it's funny because my partner Mariah and I, we played this um, not too long ago. And uh, even as, you know, me being one of the minimalists, we still were able to, like, make it through the whole month. And if you do, uh, you get rid of about 500 items. So, you know, you bet something real silly like, a, you know, maybe a dinner or something small or, or someone has to cook dinner. Or um, Dude, this is Google. You can bet a million dollars. You can bet a million dollars. <laughs> so, you know, what, 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 <laughs> raise the stakes, Nicodemus. <laughs> what Mariah did is she bet. No, this is pretty good. So Mariah was playing with a friend of hers in Fargo, North Dakota. And uh, they, the loser had to basically karaoke a song that the other per- that the winner picked out. <laughs> so um, they both ended up making it through the month, but in that case, they both won because they both had gotten rid of about 500 items. Yeah, I think, I think the, the other way, the, th- that's a very practical sort of how-to step, but the other side of, of Simplify Our Lives is understanding the why-to side of things. Like, what, what's the purpose? And so for me, the, the really important question early on was, how might your life be better with less? And, and I think by answering that question, you're able to identify the sort of benefits of minimalism for you. And I think they're different for everyone. You know, the, the, the benefits for, you know, we've got a four-year-old now, the benefits for a four-year-old are going to be so considerably different from the benefits for you versus anyone else in the room. For some people, it's health, it's finances, reclaiming your time, your attention. Um, and, and you have to figure out what those benefits are for you because that's going to give you really the leverage you need. I think we all instinctually know 
you know, how to declutter, right? You're not going to see me and Ryan write something like, here are the 67 ways for you to declutter your closet <laughs> this weekend. Because we all know how to do that. The question is, why are we doing it? Hmm. And once you understand that, I think you have the leverage you need to move forward. Yeah. How can I influence my kids towards minimalism hmm. and um, wholeness? That yeah. it doesn't come from things. What, what do you guys think about that? You know, I first embraced minimalism. I had this pivot point. My mother died. My marriage ended both in the same month. Mm. And these two events forced me to look around and start to question what had become my life's focus. And Elizabeth, I I realized that I was focused on the wrong stuff. And so when I started simplifying my life, it took me about eight months. I radically simplified. People around me started noticing something was different. Ryan came to me and said, hey, why why the heck are you so happy lately? Mm. People at work were saying, you seem less stressed. You seem so much calmer. Why why aren't you being as mean as you used to be? And it opened up the door for me to talk about this thing because I never jumped up and said, look at me. I'm becoming a minimalist and you Mm -hmm. need to too. Mm -hmm. It's not about the proselytizing of minimalism. It's about showing people what the benefits are. So I always start with a question. How might your life be better with less? And we do that with our five-year-old daughter right now. Also, how might your life be better if you're giving instead of just taking all of the time. So I think whether we're dealing with adults or kids, we have to talk about what are the benefits of simplifying for you? Because I think they're different for each of us. For me, it was just finances at first, yeah, yeah. but then it was oh, you know, rediscovering time for my creativity and, and, and for other values in my life that were important. But what are the, what are the benefits for you, Elizabeth? And then what are the be- talking about the same thing that Josh and I are talking about? Mm. And that's really about how can we control these impulses that we have on a daily basis? And when we let these impulses run amok, especially with our finances, we can find ourselves in a world of hurt. So, I mean, for Josh and I, you know, our, our, our main mission really is to help people realize, well, a couple things, a, you don't need nearly as much as what the advertisements tell you that you need Mm -hmm. and that you can be content without chasing that, that status quo American dream. And really when someone feels like they have enough, when they, when they feel secure enough, that's when they start to look outward and that's when they start to see what they can do for their community, what they can do for their friends and family. And that's, that's the one thing we really love about you all is, is, is giving is, I mean, in the every, in the every dollar app, that's the first line item that you have, uh, you suggest Mm -hmm. people budget for is giving. And ultimately Josh and I were trying to help people be content enough to where they feel like they can, they can give beyond themselves in a meaningful way.